Well, today we want to just uh, try, I doubt if we finish up, but today we want to go ahead and continue this discussion uh, uh, that we've been involved in. We had three economic concepts that uh, appear very often in macroeconomics, and we've been talking about those. The first is a consumer price index, the, uh, the, basically an index of prices paid by consumers. The second thing we talked about is the unemployment rate. If you'll remember, not the percent of the population that's unemployed, but the percent of the civilian labor force that's unemployed, right? And then the third thing, which we want to start talking about today, is gross domestic product. Gross domestic product. And by the way, uh, let me mention that uh, in the past, uh, we've, and some people will still refer to this term if you hear it, uh, I don't want you to be sort of surprised or thinking, gee, what's that about? Sometimes you'll hear people talk about gross, uh, gross national product. We're actually going to focus on gross domestic product, so I, I don't want to confuse you either in thinking that we really care about gross national product all that much. But the point is, is that for phew, decades, since the 1930s, um, American economists and uh, policymakers and so forth, they referred to gross national product, or GNP, over and over. And that is really something that's not so much in use anymore, but you will hear the term used. Um, I will come back in just a moment and tell you the difference between gross national product and gross domestic product. First of all, let's just write down a definition of gross domestic product. Gross domestic product is equal to the market value of all new, newly produced final goods and services within a one year period. And these terms are really sort of charged up. Uh, I wanted to add something, but I don't want to add it to my definition. I'll just come back and talk about it now for just a second. What you are, uh, this is, and I've mentioned it to you before, this is the broadest measure of economic performance that we have. This is the value of everything produced in the economy uh, in the United States or in Britain, depending on the country you're looking at, within the year. Here's the thing about gross national product, or gross domestic product. It refers to a geographic area. That is to say, that's all the, the, the newly produced final goods and services within the United States. There's the geography. Or within Canada or within Britain, it's a geogra geographic definition. It refers to a, a certain area where economic performance is taking place. So this is geographic. The gross national product is a little different. What it referred to was this. It's the market value of all uh, newly produced final goods and services within one year by Americans and American-owned resources. So this really refers to resource ownership. And this is a, and GDP is a geographic definition. But to give you an example, suppose that something happened like this. Suppose I moved to Mexico and started teaching economics at the University of Mexico. If I did, and I'm still an American, I haven't, you know, like changed my nationality or anything like that. I'm still an American, but I'm teaching economics in Mexico, then I would be an American-owned resource. I've been American, therefore my labor services are American-owned. And therefore, my earnings down in Mexico, my earnings would still be counted in the United States gross national product. If I took, uh, let's say I owned uh, an oil company and I took a lot of equipment overseas, my equipment from the United States, I took that overseas to Saudi Arabia and started pumping oil with that, drilling for oil, pumping the oil and so forth, then my activity, my earnings and so forth, those would be counted in gross national product because they're American resources regardless of where they're deployed. 
And so all the production by all American resources, no matter where, whether they're in the United States or elsewhere, that would be in GNP. But as soon as I go to Mexico and start teaching, I'm no longer in the geographic <coughs> confines of the United States. And since I'm no longer within the geogra geographic confines of the United States, I'm no longer part of gross domestic product for the United States. I become a part of gross domestic product for Mexico. That's the difference between these two. Now, here's the deal. We, we can measure what's going on within our economy. We know what's going on within our economy. Well, to a certain extent, I don't mean to say we know everything. But what I'm saying is that the United States government has got more or less control of things within its borders. Uh, it can require people within the United States to fill out forms and provide information. And so when we start calculating gross domestic product, we think, hey, we know quite a bit. And also, this is our, our interest, our primary interest. The people in Washington that make policy, they're thinking about the 50 states. They're not thinking about, gosh, what are Americans earning in Saudi Arabia or in Mexico, and let's have a policy to somehow affect that, increase it, decrease it. They don't think about that. They're thinking about, we want to affect the United States economy. And if there's, uh, let's say, a person in, uh, from Mexico working in the United States, then so be it. Uh, they would, their earnings would be included in gross domestic product for the United States, even though that person's from another country. Our policies will affect that country. And he or she, that country, that person, he or she is here. And so anyway, policymakers are most concerned about this geographic idea of affecting policy or affecting conditions within the United States geographic area. And so this is really the measure, gross domestic product, is really the one that corresponds most closely to what policymakers are trying to influence or affect. And so gross national product, even though we used it for years, is a little bit inferior to gross domestic product for the purposes of understanding the macro economy and for the purposes of making policy. Okay, so anyway, we'll talk about gross domestic product almost always. Every once in a while, I might want to switch over and talk about gross um, national product, but I'll for sure point that out if I do. Gross domestic product, let's underline a few of these terms and talk about them. GDP is the market value. Well, here's how we decide what something's worth. When we're doing the calculation, we're going to go to the marketplace and we'll find out what the market says something's worth. If, uh, let's say that it costs $50 to get into a basketball game, professional basketball game, then we'll value that ticket or attendance at um, $50. We won't say, well, that's stupid, that's entertainment, that's fluff, that's not real. Here's something that's real. We produce a car, it's worth $20,000. It's solid, it produces services, people can go down the road. We'll put that $20,000 in, but not that $50 basketball ticket. Look, if people are willing to pay $50 for that basketball ticket, that's its value to people, the services that they're buying. And we put the value of those services right in there into gross domestic product. So market values. We don't have any artificial values, economists or government officials or policymakers. They don't get to come along and say, valued at this or that, we put in the market value. Also, if our government produces something, either the state government or the city government or the national government, if the government produces something, what we try to do is calculate a market value of those services provided by the government and put those values in too. Not just uh, what it costs the government to produce it, but what's its value. In theory, that's what we're trying to do. Here's the word new in there, newly produced. This, we have absolutely no uh, production from previous years. If, uh, you know, starting on January 1st and ending on December 31st, uh, we're interested in what production occurs within that period, new production. Their final goods and services. What do we mean by final goods and services? I mean this. Mm, once, if we call something a final good or a final service, that means it's ready to be consumed by the ultimate consumer. There's something else called intermediate goods. Intermediate goods are used in the production of other goods. And let me give you an example. Suppose that I've got a company and what I manufacture is windshields for cars. I manufacture the windshield and then I send it off to General Motors and General Motors buys it from me and then General Motors goes ahead and puts that in a car and sells it to you. Well, my window that I produce, the windshield, is not a final good because I'm not selling it for final consumption. I'm selling it to another company, and that other company is going to use it in production. 
So we do not account my window windshield that I just produced, we do not count that in gross domestic product. Only if I was selling it to you. Okay. Uh, goods and services. So we're not just talking about something tangible you can hold on to, but we're also talking about intangible services. And there's a lot of things that are services, but things you can't like carry around or touch or drive or eat, but like a haircut would be a service. Uh, going to the movie, that's a service, entertainment services, but you'd be entertained for a while and then you go away and there's nothing tangible you're carrying home with you, it, it all exists in your head or else you might have forgotten it. And then, of course, within this one-year period, um, that's an important thing as well. So anyway, um, and I've gotten my notes here to be sure and mention the borders, the geographic borders. This, all these things in our definition that we're talking about, these are sort of charged up terms. Uh, and of course, production is sort of implied. I didn't make a big deal about it. But mm, these are the things that are being produced. There's resources being consumed into making these things. Okay, this is what we mean by gross domestic product. Everything produced this year, whether it's good or service, within the United States for final consumption. Okay, questions about this? What does it not include? Let me do a little erasing. GDP does not include One. What does it not include? It does not include the value of used goods. That is to say, General Motors, let's say, produces a new car and sells it, then that new car is, goes into gross domestic product as, hey, that's part of new production this year. But suppose then the person that buys that new car from General Motors, they say, oh, I've got a used car here, and they sell that to you. The value of that uh, used car, I mean, the used car can be very valuable, but even though it is very valuable, it does not go into this year's GDP. We already counted that in a previous year when it was first produced, when it first came off the assembly line. So we do not count those used goods again. And two, we do not count labor services in the home. Labor services in the home are valuable, but they don't get counted in gross domestic product. Now, not entirely, but usually, yes. So like babysitting, babysitting would be an example, yes. Or, you know, cooking or sewing or vacuuming or all those other things that I do on the weekends. So if a plumber came in and fixed your pipes, does that count? Pardon me? I've never needed a plumber to fix my pipes, but if a plumber came to your home to fix your pipes, then that would be where you're hiring somebody from outside. It's not services, oh, I see what you're saying here. Um, produced by residents, how about that? Maybe that will make it a little bit clearer and your question cleared that up for me, is if the plumber came to your home, it would be services within the home, but not produced sort of internally there. That would be outside production. So. Thanks for, uh, with your question, clearing that up. This, if it's like, really, we're talking about the husband or wife or mom or dad or, you know, the roommates or whatever, we're saying that the people who live in that home, uh, that we don't count their production. Yes? So if you hire a babysitter, then that is If you hire a babysitter, then in theory, that would go into gross domestic product. Okay? And if you ever need a babysitter, give me a call. On weekends, I don't, you know, do it through the week, but weekends I have plenty of time. Um, by the way, I just read something in, where did I read that? It wasn't a newspaper, it must have been a magazine. Uh, I read about an accountant, and I can't recall what state he was in, but this accountant, he decided what he was going to do is uh, start paying his wife. And so he started paying his wife for things, and then uh, for the services she produced, but, and then he would send her, what do they call it, 1099 form, or no, that's not it, 1040 at the end of the year. Uh, or a W-2, I guess it is. Send her a W-2 at the end of the year, you know, and here's how much income you've had. 
And then he starts counting this stuff off as business expenses. And so he's got expenses, and she's below the point where she has to pay income tax. So basically, she's not paying tax, and he is deducting how much he paid her and lowering his income and therefore lowering his uh, tax bill. And so uh, him being an accountant, he knew, you know, I guess all the loopholes and so forth, and he found a certain form, and he's filled this out, and, and the IRS knows all about it, and they're just saying, well, yeah, that's legal. And so uh, maybe that'll be a trend in the future, and so then they will start paying, you know, uh, housewives or house husbands, whoever it is that's staying home doing the housework. I don't think you can pay yourself. But anyway, that's the idea. What was it this, uh, one second, it seems to me they said this guy saved $6,000 a year on his taxes. That seems like a lot, doesn't it? I don't know how they did it. Anyway, um, other than these weird cases like this, what I'm saying is people who are living in the home, if they produce their own services, let's say you go out in the backyard and you put a couple tomato plants in the ground and water them and tomatoes come up and you pluck those tomatoes and you eat those tomatoes, mm, that's more the same kind of uh, household services in a sense. It's outside in the yard, but it's still on your property. So we don't count that as part of GDP. Questions? Underground economic activity. And I'm talking about stuff that occurs like in basements mainly, in caves. No, that's not true. I'm not talking about basements and caves. The underground economy, this is the part of the economy where transactions, I had you going with that cave and the, no, I didn't. Transactions not recorded. The underground economy is that part of the economy where people are not writing down, you know, sort of taking official uh, transactions, not writing those down, recording them. Now, there's two types of underground economic activity. One is illegal activity, okay, uh, drugs, prostitution, pornography, uh, I mean, all kinds of stuff like that. That's, the activities themselves are illegal. And why are the transactions not recorded? Well, because you don't want to say, oh, yes, and, I, and you know, like I'm a pornographer or whatever. I'm a, I won't tell you what I am. Anyway, uh, I was going to get into all this, uh, you know, various terminology. But anyway, I'm, in, uh, I'm selling drugs, you know, and I'm making $100,000 a year. People don't go, yeah, I'm a drug dealer, $100,000 a year. Turn that into the IRS, pay their taxes, and go, hey, now I'm clear with the IRS. Because you know what would happen is the IRS would turn your name over to the, um, uh, what, to the police. FBI. Um, so anyway, we don't record those kinds of transactions and illegal activities. Since we don't record them, then they don't get turned into the government, and the government doesn't know about them, they don't count them in GDP. But there are some legal activities that are also part of the underground economy. For example, let's say you own a restaurant. And you've got a cash register up by the door, and your customers come up there and they say, okay, a good meal, you know, I want to pay for dinner. And you say, okay, and you push a couple of buttons there, you know, $23, they pay you $23, they leave. And let's say you don't have any sort of uh, tape in your cash register. You're pushing the buttons and it's making all the right noises and so forth. And the drawer is opening up and you're getting the change out and you're putting in the $23. But there's no record made of this transaction. Don't have a tape in there. Well, now, why wouldn't you have a tape in there? And how about a couple of, of answers? One, you don't want to pay sales tax to the state of Missouri. Two, you don't want to pay income tax to the federal government. And so then at the end of the year, you know, maybe you've only had that tape in your cash register 100 days out of the year or, or 200 days rather than 365 days. So at the end of the year, when you actually get all your records together, it shows that your income is only a fraction of its total amount and you've been able to save on taxes. So the activity itself is legal, running a restaurant. That's a legal activity, but the fact that you're not recording those transactions, you're doing that to avoid paying taxes, which itself is illegal, but the underlying activity isn't. I'm saying the underground economy, we call it the underground economy when it's just not recorded, not sort of visible, not counted. So, the underground, or underground economic activity, that's not in gross domestic product. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. Like, like, 
Well, the black market is generally considered to be, and now the United States doesn't have a lot of black market activity, but generally, yeah, that's what you would call the black market. Okay? Uh, our black market activity is, and let me talk about that for just one second, but for us, the black market is these things right here. But in a, a lot of countries, they have laws that, you know, say you can't buy and sell certain things, or you can't buy or sell at a certain price, or at a certain day, or a certain time. And there's just a long list of do's and don'ts, and then things fall into the underground economy just from that long list of do's and don'ts. And I guess in theory that's encompassed in these, but I'm just saying we don't have a lot of those laws. Yes, sir? Yes. If you're running a business out of your home, and, and we'll assume now that you are recording your transactions and so forth, yes, that is included in GDP. So the, what we really, are, I guess, are doing in this particular case is we're saying if you're running a business out of your home, part of your home's a home and part of your home's a business. And I'm saying that part that's the business, we do record that. And these are really household services. The typical man, maybe you're interested in this, the typical man will work about 10 hours a week doing what are classified as household services. Um, <clears throat> but those household services aren't all just, you know, dusting and cooking and cleaning. They include things like working on the car, working in the garden, mowing the yard, shopping for groceries, and so forth. Uh, uh, so anyway, all those things put together, the average man, about 10 hours a week, uh, some more, some less, obviously. Uh, the average woman would be closer to 20 to 25 hours a week. And w women who are not in the labor force, that is, who are uh, homemakers, uh, they will work much more than this, and maybe 40 hours a week. But uh, anyway, men work much less performing uh, or producing these household services. Let's take this number, and I, just for, for fun, let's say that the typical woman, 20 hours a week times, we'll say she gets two weeks of vacation just because that makes the calculation easy. Uh, 50 weeks per year equals 1,000 hours per year. Let's say the value of those services, just to pick a number out, uh, let's say $8 an hour, then those services are worth about $8,000 per year. Those are very rounded off numbers. I don't mean to let on like there's something you could uh, put in a bank there or something like that, but uh, you get a general idea of the magnitudes that we're talking about this way. And probably they at $8 an hour, eh, that's a ballpark number. Um, you know, a lot of people think that uh, household services are sort of unskilled labor, but they're not unskilled labor. If you hire this stuff done, you've got to go out and pay some pretty high wages oftentimes a lot more than $8 an hour. It's basically, household services seem like unskilled labor. They give that appearance because the people who are doing it, they don't go to college in order to learn how to run a vacuum cleaner or to sew something or to do the laundry or whatever. Uh, and where do they learn those things? And the answer is, uh, when we're talking about females for sure, usually they started learning about the time they were five or six years old, and they just learned how to produce these services all the way up until they go out and have a house of their own get married or whatever. And so from about, let's say, the age of six up until the age of, what, 22, so there's 16 years, they've been in training. And they've got on-the-job training. So mm, these are really skilled workers by the time they've been working on this job for mm, 16 years. And then, of course, they've got many years to go ahead of them. But, but the point is, is that these are not unskilled uh, services. And if you want to go out and hire somebody to, uh, let's say that you just want somebody to do a little bit of sewing for you. Maybe you popped a couple buttons off your shirt and you got a tear in it, and you say, hey, I want somebody to put these buttons on and, and fix this tear, go out and hire somebody to do that for you and find out that that's not minimum wage work. And a lot of other things are the same thing. Somebody cooks dinner for you. You might go, oh, yeah, I cook dinner. You know, Mom's done that ever since I was a baby, so that's no big deal. Well, go out and hire somebody to be your cook and see what it costs you. And especially somebody who's cooking you like, um, you know, people, I could cook for you if you didn't have any taste at all, but uh, you wouldn't be willing to pay me anything. But the point is, is that if somebody can put a nice dinner on the table, you go out and, you know, to a restaurant and buy that dinner, and maybe it costs 50 bucks for three or four people to eat. 
And then here you are eating it at home and going, yeah, this is unskilled labor that provided this. I don't know about that. These are pretty valuable services. $8,000 a year, maybe more. And as I say, if you're talking about a full-time homemaker, we might be talking about twice that much. There have been surveys done also where people compare the quality of something produced by the people living in the home, they're producing it for themselves, versus something that an outsider comes in and provides. You know, you hire somebody off the street to come in and, or not off the street, but get the yellow pages out and they come in and they produce something in your home for you. You know, there's a decent chance that when they go away, you pay them off and they go away, there's a decent chance you'll go, yeah, that was okay, but I didn't like it very well. This guy didn't clean up after himself or didn't do this or didn't do that. And you're doing that for yourself and you don't make those little mistakes. You just stay at it until it's done. So a lot of people think that the services produced by the people living in the home are of higher quality, especially taking care of the kids. You know what it's like. You take some kid to the daycare center or something like that or to a babysitter and uh, they don't love that kid the way that the parents do, and so the kid's not going to get as much guidance, not enough as much attention, and so forth. And so those services, um, typically, that you purchase uh, are of a lower quality than are produced within the household. Anyway, I've given that plenty of attention, but what I'm saying to you is we are ignoring huge amounts of money not putting in a gross national product or gross domestic product. If you multiply this by, uh, let's take um, 100 million and I'm saying maybe there are 100 million adult females in the United States. Uh, you multiply that by 100 million, and what do you have here? You've got uh, the, uh, the 100 billion times eight. Uh, this is $800 billion, I think. We're closing in on a trillion dollars worth of services that we're leaving out of gross domestic product. Okay. Now, let me also mention one other thing. Other countries, let's take India as an example. Other countries, um, people will stay at home and produce a lot for themselves. In the United States, and so in those other countries where people produce a lot for themselves of, in the way of these household services, there's a lot being left out of gross domestic product. In the United States, we're moving it more in the direction of hiring things done. In the United States, there are a lot of people who have somebody come in and mow their lawn. And so if you mow your own lawn, it does not go in gross domestic product. If you hire somebody else to mow your lawn, it does go in gross domestic product. So in the United States, where we have a lot of outside workers come in and work in a household, relative to other countries, I'm saying, and also relative to our own past. So in the United States, we're moving in the direction of more and more being included or captured in gross domestic product. You can imagine that, you know, if your kids were taken care of by somebody else and somebody else mows your yard and somebody else, you know, comes in and vacuums your rug and so forth, then uh, all of those services are going to gross domestic product. Number, what's next? Four, uh, purchases and, and sales of financial securities. Financial securities are not goods and services. They're assets, but they're not goods and services in the sense that we're counting them here. Plus, most financial securities, they just go from hand to hand. I buy a stock, uh, a share of AT&T stock, I hold it for three years. I sell you the share of stock, you hold it for two years, you sell it to somebody else. In a sense, it's used goods. You know, it's uh, most of the sales and purchases of stock are changing hands, but it's not a new stock. But even if it's new, we don't count that until the company that issues stock, it takes your money, and then it goes out and purchases, let's say, capital equipment or something like that. Then we would count that, that capital equipment, but not the stock purchases. Um, and also, we wouldn't count not only stocks, but bonds, bank accounts, mm, uh, life insurance policies, and so forth. Number, whatever, five, a full of, hey, that was four right there. Number five, the value of leisure. The value of leisure. Let's just take, uh, you know, the sort of typical day has got 24 hours in it, and that typical day uh, the worker goes to work, a full-time worker works eight hours, so in a typical day there's 16 hours of non-working time. 
Some of that we're sleeping, some of it we're not sleeping, but there's 16 hours a day of leisure time. You're either working or you're not working, and if you're not, we call that leisure. 16 hours a day. What's that time worth? What's the value of leisure time worth? Or what's the value worth? What is leisure time worth? What's its value? Would you just say nothing? We don't include it in gross domestic product. Would you say its value is nothing? Because if you say the value of my leisure is nothing, then what I say to you is, why don't you come uh, to my house this weekend and wash my car for me? Mow the yard? And if you say, I don't want to, I say, well, why not? You've got nothing better to do. Just hanging around watching TV or doing whatever. You think your leisure time is not worth anything. I'll give you a dollar an hour, 10 cents an hour. You come out ahead. Your leisure time's worth something. Mine's worth something. In fact, suppose this. Suppose you're working for $10 an hour. You're working 40 uh, hours a week, we'll assume, $10 an hour. Then my question for you is, why didn't you work for 41 hours? Why didn't you work one more hour? Now, it may be that, that your boss didn't let you work 41 hours. That is to say, go from 40 to 40. Maybe your boss won't let you, but you could go out and get a second job. But let's just say that you have an opportunity to work overtime, 41 hours rather than 40 hours, and you decide, no. There was somebody going to pay you $10 an hour, and maybe if you get time and a half, maybe they're going to pay you $15 an hour for working that extra hour. And you said, no, doesn't that tell us that your leisure time is more valuable to you than either $10 or $15 an hour, depending on whatever you turn down? You know about opportunity cost. Whatever opportunity you've turned down, you say, if I go from 40 to 41 hours, I get an extra $15. If you turn down that opportunity to have $15, what you're saying is that one hour of leisure time is worth more than $15 to me. Leisure time can be pretty valuable. What do you think that's worth? What do you think is an average? <laughs> don't look at me. I don't know. But I think that leisure time is pretty valuable. And, and boy, once the, you know, one hour a week, I just gave you an example there, go from 40 to 41 hours. You can kind of let that go. But what if it was an extra 10 hours a week or an extra 15 or an extra 20? How many hours a week have? If you were thinking 168, you were right. Uh, anyway, uh, an hour's got 160, or a, a week's got 168 hours. You work 40 maybe. You're down to 128 hours. And I'm saying uh, out of that 128, seven times, let's say you sleep seven hours a night. I can do the numbers in my head. Seven hours a night, seven nights, that's 49 hours. So we're down to, uh, what do we have here, uh, 79 hours? That is to say, here's your, uh, this is the total number of hours. Here's your working hours. Here's your sleeping hours. Maybe you sleep a little bit more than seven hours a night. But seven works out okay. So you're up to 79 hours of, uh, what, waking leisure time. Boy, you know, these are pretty scarce hours, and people start buying those up from you, taking your weekends away and stuff, and after a while, you start getting cranky and unhappy, and, oh, I'm miserable, and i got to be paid a lot more to take that kind of a job. Leisure time's pretty valuable, but we don't value it at all in gross domestic product. Would you sell all your leisure time for $10 an hour? Let's say, not the sleep time, but other than the sleep, would you take an extra $790 uh, dollars a week? for all your leisure time other than sleeping in that first 40 hours? You know, you're working 40 hours. An extra $10 an hour? Maybe for just one or two weeks, right? Anyway, value of leisure. I'm saying that altogether, the 16 hours of leisure a day is probably worth more than the eight hours of work a day. And if that's true, then we're not calculating in like two-thirds of my day is not being included in gross domestic product. By the way, one way of estimating the value of leisure is out there. Let me sort of take you through that kind of quickly. Um, I won't put it on any tests or anything like that because uh, I will kind of run through it quickly. But, but let's do this. What we see is that people spend money on things like smoke detectors. They spend money on safety devices in general, smoke detectors, seat belts, safer cars versus riskier cars, and so forth. We see people spend money on things, merchandise, that, keeps, that prolongs their life, that saves their life. 
And so let's say that you see somebody spending, and I'll just use a number here of, let's say you see somebody spend $20, and that reduces their chances of being killed by 1 in 100,000. That is, if you don't have a smoke detector, there's a 1 in 100,000 chance that you get killed by a fire that, you know, uh, erupts in the middle of the night and just kills you in bed. But if you do have a $20 smoke detector, then the chance of your being killed uh, in a fire in bed, at night in bed is zero. So you've reduced your odds of being killed by one in 100,000. Then if you're willing to spend $20 for something and it reduces your risk of dying one in 100,000, that means that your whole life you must value by about $2 million. That is to say, if you had a $2 million prize, and you had something that could uh, protect that $2 million prize, sort of like a service contract or something like that, but protect that and, you know, and it re reduce the chances of you losing that thing by one in 100,000, you'd be willing to pay up to $20 to get that thing. Now, what's this all about? And the answer is, assuming these things are true, then what that says is that person values their life at $2 million. And what they are valuing in their life, this has got some eight hours a day where they work, and maybe over a lifetime, all of your work for the eight hours a day and so forth, maybe the value of that is, let's say, $250,000. I don't know what it is, but that's not very high, is it? Let's say $500,000. Eight hours a day of work for your whole life, maybe you earn $500,000. And then you got 16 hours a day of leisure if you think your entire life is worth $2 million and the, the wages part or the working part of your life is worth a half a million, then the leisure must be worth one and one half million. Isn't that an odd way to come about measuring this? So this value of leisure we can measure or estimate, I should say, by using techniques like this. Now, there have been people, and I haven't personally done these studies, but there have been uh, economists who have done a lot of these types of studies, and they don't just use information from smoke detectors, but um, various types of studies have been done, different decisions people make, and they come up with numbers that are in the neighborhood of about $3 million for the, the value of life, and that is to say what people themselves are valuing their life at. I'm not saying that I, as an economist, look at you and say, your life's worth $3 million. What I'm saying is, is you and me and people who make decisions to buy smoke detectors, seat belts, uh, flotation devices for boats, and, and things like that, we are valuing our own life at about $3 million a piece. And so, mm, we take out the value of your working hours and the only hours remaining are the leisure hours and that sort of tells us what your leisure time's worth in a lifetime and and I just gave you some sort of goofy numbers there they aren't exact but you get the idea from that we don't value leisure it's extremely valuable number six we do not value uh, damage to the environment Let's say that uh, somebody starts up a factory and they're manufacturing steel and they're pumping uh, their you know, smoke and all kinds of waste materials up into the air through those smokestacks, then that's doing damage to the environment. What we'll do is we'll come out and we'll say something like, okay, that's steel, $300 a ton. And we'll put the $300 a ton into gross domestic product. But the manufacturer, the steel's not paying anybody. The people who are living out in the countryside and so forth that are breathing in this dirty air, they're just suffering with that and they're not being compensated and the steel maker just says, no, the air, that's free. I'm not paying for it, I'm not including it in my costs. And so we would ignore the damage to the environment and it might be that we're doing, a ton of steel might be worth itself $300, but we might be doing $50 worth of damage to the environment. So what we should be putting in gross domestic product, if we want to have a more exact number of what is it we're producing during the year, we might come up with a $250 a ton number. But we're ignoring the damage to the environment, so we say $300 a ton. Poor countries tend to have more damage to the environment than rich countries. Rich countries tend to say things like, gosh, it's kind of smoky here. Why don't we just have some policy that says we can't put so much smoke up into the air, so much uh, 
uh, pollution in the ground or in the water or something like that. Rich countries tend to have those policies. Poor countries say, you know, that would be nice to have clean air, but we can't afford it. And also, poor countries tend to do a lot more sort of manufacturing kind of stuff, whereas rich countries tend to have a lot more services, you know, haircuts or entertainment services or things like that. And uh, services tend not to do damage to the environment. And so rich countries where they have a lot of services in their economy, they don't do as much environmental damage as poorer countries, other things being equal. Now, the United States has a large population, big economy. We do more damage to the environment than a small country like, um, uh, oh, I don't know, Panama or something like that. But on a per capita basis, uh, I'm saying that rich countries do not do as much in, uh, damage to the environment per person, other things being equal, as, um, as, what, as poor countries do. Here's what GDP is not. Not a measure of happiness or well-being. Gross domestic product is just not meant to be that. That's not really a shortcoming. I mean, it, it, it's in a sense a shortcoming. If that's what you were after, is a measure of happiness or well-being, then that's a shortcoming of gross domestic product. Economists knew that they weren't going to measure happiness this way, and that was never the idea when GDP was conceived. And so, but don't interpret it that way. It is absolutely not true. And by the way, GDP we can divide down to a, and I'll put this term down here, per capita GDP. Capita means head, and so per head, per person measure of GDP. And all we would do is we take the total GDP and divide by the population to get this per capita. Well, total GDP per capita GDP or your income or my income as individuals, that is just not a measure of happiness or well-being. There are things that make you happy that you don't pay anything for. I didn't say it didn't have a cost, but in terms of dollars changing hands, no dollars changes hands. It doesn't get captured in gross domestic product. It just doesn't get measured. For example, the leisure. My job, consider my job, uh, what I have every year, uh, and I like my job, so don't take anything I say against that, but here's what I have every single year. I have a three-month summer vacation. <laughs> I have a Christmas break. I have a spring break have a, what, a few days off for Thanksgiving and whatever, I'm probably not working over about eight months a year. So my job comes with a lot of leisure time. Now, I use that time to read and write and do things like that, but, you know, this, the time off. But the point is, is that that makes my job really desirable to me, and I'm saying that that doesn't get captured, the value of my leisure time doesn't get captured in gross domestic product. Somebody else, they will work, maybe, maybe not even take any vacation. And so, anyway, uh, what I'm saying to you is there's more to life than just earning money. And that being the case, these money or these dollar measures of either the nation's production or you as an individual, your production, the dollars don't get it done. There's just more to life than that. And I'm sure you know that, but it's kind of easy to sort of forget these things that you already know. If I get up here and I write a bunch of these formulas on the board and we have to put the dollar values there and divide and multiply and do all that stuff, it's kind of easy to get into the whole swing of thinking, oh, yeah, dollars, and, you know, and calculate everything with those dollars. And what I'm saying to you is economists know better than that. And since you already knew better than to just put a dollar value on everything, uh, you knew better than that when you came into this class. Don't forget your common sense and start thinking that uh, everything that's worthwhile shows up in gross domestic product. It simply doesn't. History. Gross national product and gross domestic product is it's really called national income accounting. And there's more than just GNP and GDP. But GNP and GDP, we call this national income accounting. 
And these are the national income accounts that we uh, talk about. And this was developed in the 1930s by a guy named Simon Kuznets, K-U-Z-N-E-T-S. And he later won the Nobel Prize in Economics for developing this stuff. And he's not the only one. There were other people that worked with him and uh, received Nobel Prizes and other things for their work in this area. Okay, but the 1930s is when this stuff got developed. And the reason I mention that to you is if somebody starts talking to you about, oh, you know, gross national product in the 1800s or whatever, and if somebody starts talking to you about uh, before the 1930s, the mid-1930s, if they start telling you what gross domestic product was in some other time and place, then you should be skeptical or ask questions like, where'd you come up with that number? Now, here's what we do is, now that we've got these techniques established for calculating gross domestic product, we can go back to earlier times and make some estimates of what we think GDP would have been 200 years ago or 1,000 years ago or whatever. But I'm saying it's really just been in uh, the last 60, 70 years that this stuff has been uh, calculated and made available. The United States and then uh, Britain, UK, uh, the United States and Britain were the first countries to do this kind of stuff. You know what was happening in the 1930s was there was a Great Depression. And since there was the Great Depression, everybody was focused on the economy. Oh, things are miserable, we're not doing so good, what's the matter, and so forth. And since they had all this focus on the economy, then um, the government wanted to get out there and have people measuring the size of the economy. Who measures this? The Commerce Department. U.S. Department of Commerce measures GDP. How do they do it? Here's what they could do. They could have a government official standing in every factory, every workplace with a clipboard and just writing this stuff down. Okay, there went a car, there went some tires, there went, you know, a haircut. That's not how it's done. This is done from surveys. And other methods. For example, the Commerce Department will ask the Internal Revenue Service, hey, how much do people earn? And you know, we have to report our income, unless we're part of that underground economy. We report our income to the Internal Revenue Service. So there's information out there that the Department of Commerce can go to the IRS and ask them information. But then there's other stuff. There's Social Security records. There's census um, uh, surveys of households. I think I told you last time how that about 50 to 60,000 households get surveyed every month by the Census uh, Bureau uh, in order for us to come up with these reports on the unemployment rate and things like that. Well, that's true, but the Census Bureau is not just asking about unemployment. They've got a series of other questions, and that provides information. Then the Commerce Department, the Commerce Department is already uh, is collecting information, asking que questions of businesses. So they ask businesses, how many cars are you producing this year? Right? How many hamburgers did you sell this year? So there's that information. Uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, they can go down to where uh, ships get unloaded at the docks, you know, and they got those, uh, what do you call those forklifts that pick stuff up and set it down on the dock, and there's people there keeping track of all that stuff and, and calculating tariffs or duties or uh, taxes on imports and different terms that mean the same. So this information's out there, and the Commerce Department gets a hold of all of it and brings that all together and comes out with a single number. They report this number every quarter, and then we get those reports, quarterly reports on gross domestic product. That's where we'll end next time, or this time. Next time, I will show you some numbers for gross domestic product, and we'll continue with this. We should finish this material next time. So long.